Thank you, Matt. What an excellent story. Well, 4th District Congressman Jim Jordan is joining us now here in the studio. And if you follow Faith and Friends very closely, you'll notice that we really don't talk politics very much here on the show. We're a lot more into food and fun and encouraging you through the scripture. But we do encourage you often to pray for your political um, officials as well as for the government in general. And so, Congressman Jordan, thank you so much for joining us My here pleasure. at TV 44. And before we get started talking about the stuff that's that's taking place in Washington, mm -hmm. how can our viewers be praying for you and for Washington, for the government in general? Well, um, well we certainly appreciate uh, the, the folks who pray for us. Uh, sometimes I'll be out and about and we'll hear people come up to us, you know, our, our family prays for you. And, and um, that is just always encouraging to hear. Um, but the main thing I would say is what, what I'm sure you do and what so many Christians are doing, just pray for the country. It's a critical, um, troubling time, I think, in, the, in, the, in, in our nation. You think about the foreign policy concerns, the threat of terrorism, our fiscal problems. But probably more importantly is just the cultural concerns we see out there. Basic principles, basic values, that um, we have accepted and believed in and that we think have served the country so well and served Americans and people and Christians so well uh, are under attack. And so I would say just pray for all that. Um, for me specifically, um, I always talk about my, my favorite scripture verse is 2 Timothy 4, 7, where Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. And so um, just pray that, that we as Christians will you know, put that verse into practice. Yeah. Fight the fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. And do it in, a, in, a, in the right way, with a smile on our face, but, but do it and, and, and live by it if we can. Nine and a half years, we were talking before we yeah. started here, you've been a congressman for nine Long and time. a half years. So you've <laughs> seen a lot of change, uh, both in our country and in, mm. our, our, in Washington, D.C. Um, you were here a couple weeks ago talking about welfare reform mm -hmm. and the Upward Mobility Act. Yeah. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk with you when you were in Lima then. People may have saw the uh, Lima News or watched NWLIO, right. right. but, but um, you're pretty passionate about this, about this issue. Well, this is, yeah, we think this is important. You, you know, look at the growth in food stamps, for example. Uh, when President Obama took office, almost eight years ago, we had 17 million Americans on what's called the SNAP program, the food stamp program. Mm -hmm. Today, it's almost 47 million Americans. So huge growth in just that one social welfare uh, program. Uh, we think that there are better ways to help people uh, where we actually incentivize work. And so the bill we've introduced specifically with the food stamp program, we say, look, if you're an able-bodied adult, so that 47 million uh, Americans, there are a significant number who are single, able-bodied adults, no dependents. We said, look, you, you should have some kind of work requirement uh, before you get help from the taxpayer. We think that having that is treating taxpayers with the respect they deserve. But more importantly, is going to help those individuals who maybe sort of get stuck in the system, trapped in the system, and kind of dependent on government. We think it's going to give them sort of the tough love push they need to get to a better position in life. Um, and we should have that, frankly, that concept throughout our social safety net systems. We have 79 different means-tested social welfare programs with the federal government. Um, we think it's better to try to combine those and incentivize work. And, I, and I, I tell folks all the time, think about some of the first jobs you had, probably making not a whole lot of money, but how you learn principles and values and lessons in those jobs that help you get to a better position mm -hmm. later in life. I would imagine that many of the people listening at home would agree with what you're saying that, yeah, we have an issue. We've got problems. We, we need people to get off their couch yep. and to start working. Yep. Um, but we also are in a transitional year this year. And what is the likelihood of seeing this that you've introduced actually moving through and becoming? Great question. It, it, it's probably not going to become law. But you, you want to start the conversation and get things moving in the right direction. We'll see what happens in November. Uh, with the Congress, with the Senate, with, with, the, um, with the big race for the White House. Um, but the idea is to begin to start laying the groundwork to say, look, let's, let's, let's change this. Some states have done it, particularly the state of Maine. And they found that they, they put in a work requirement for able-bodied singles, uh, you know, no dependents, that um, they found an 80% reduction in that, that population group. And what, what they saw was most people said, well, instead of just doing the work requirement, I'll just go get a job. Imagine mm -hmm. that. And that's good for taxpayers, 
But I would argue it's good for that individual. It's going to help them get to a better position, move to a better, um, better station, better job, better opportunities in the future for them. And that's good for them, their family, and, and, and good for the country. Well, there was an article in the Lima News just recently talking about the number of jobs that exist right here in Allen County. So the jobs are there. Definitely need there to, are opportunities. To we, get we hear out. it all the time. We hear it all the time from employers. Look, we're, we're, we're trying to hire people. And one of the things that would help us is if the social safety net system wasn't so um, attractive, um, that would be helpful. And we hear it from employers all the time. Yeah. Now you uh, you mentioned Washington. You mentioned the changes. Um, let's just let's just talk politics uh, elections quickly, mm -hmm. because I feel like the voters are kind of sending a message, and um, I'm hearing a lot of people saying this is kind of our message. We are fed up with what we see in government. We're rejecting anybody who's from the system. Yep. What do you think about that? No, it's just the truth. I had I had breakfast. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I guess now, maybe now two months ago with Pat Cadell, actually a Democrat strategist, um, but a guy who's kind of fed up with the whole thing himself, even though he's still involved in politics. And he, he mentioned three numbers to me. He said, Jim, remember 70, 60, 80. Seventy percent of uh, the country thinks that our nation's in decline. Uh, Sixty percent say they're better off than their parents, but their children will likely be worse off than them. And 80 percent, to your point, Jennifer, 80 percent said, they believe Washington's completely rigged against them. The town exists to serve the political elite, the big corporations with the big lobbyists, and all the connected people at the expense of regular middle class families. And the reason 80% of America believes that is because it's true. I've been in this town, I've seen where if, if, you, if you have the big lobbyists and the, and the big connections and you're part of some big labor or big, big corporations or, or, or big business, you get to the front of the line. And that's not how it's supposed to work. So we actually put together a group a um, year and a half ago, a group of members we, we called the Freedom Caucus. And our mission statement, we talk about the countless number of families who feel like Washington has forgotten them. Mm -hmm. Our job is to remember them, fight for them, and, and in real simple terms, do what we told them we were going to do when they elected us to go mm -hmm. represent them. And that's what we try to do. We try to do it with a smile on our face. But, but there is a frustration out there. We're seeing it, I think, play out both parties in this presidential nominating uh, process we are going through. Well, it's complete on the Republican side. The Democrats are still going through it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a real frustration there. And it's time that we, we just, we make it way too complicated. Do what you told the voters you were going to do. If we go do that, I think we'll be all right. So you think that Americans should still have hope? Oh, yeah. Should they still, uh, oh, yeah. should they not give up at this point? Never forget, it's, it's America. You know, we got our concerns, we got our problems, and I think they're maybe real and in some ways maybe things we haven't seen before, but it's still the best thing going. And we have risen to the occasion every single time. I heard a guy give a speech not too long ago, and he said, it's interesting, every third generation's had to do something big in this country. Started with the founders, I and mean, they, they started this experiment in liberty, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, self-government, I mean, amazing, amazing formula they set up. And they had to win against all odds that no one thought they could, taking on Great Britain and, and, and defeating them. Three generations later, Civil War, we had this terrible evil called slavery. There was a war fought over that, and we got rid of it, and we came back together as a country. Three generations later, it was the Great War, the Second World War, and we took on the evils of Nazism and Imperial Japan and everything else. And that generation rose to the occasion. And now here we are three generations later with our own set of big problems, fiscally, terrorism, um, culturally. But I'm confident that Americans will once again rise to the occasion, deal with it, and will continue to be the leader of the world. All right, and of course, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan does have a office right here in Lima, so you can find uh, contacts right here if you wanted to ask questions, make comments. There is the address, the phone number, and his website, jordan.house.gov. And we'll be right back after this.